since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with a full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from the guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure waters. Let us pray. No. Let us please stand for our reading of our scripture. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 through 12. Who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground, he has no form of comeliness, and, we, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief when you make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasures of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, by righteous servants shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord is already blessed. You may be seated. Let us pray. Oh God, it is yet once again we've assembled in this place called Sanctuary. On the day that we have labeled Good Friday. But God, if truth be told, it wasn't a good day for you. Because on this day we know that after being betrayed, that on that Friday, begin a gruesome process of saving humanity. On that Friday, you saw fit to let your son be tortured beaten, mocked. And it wasn't because you didn't have anything else to do, God. It is because solely because you looked down through time and eternity and you saw the face of everyone that is sitting in this space called sanctuary. And you said, although it's going to hurt me dearly to put my son through, when I, I see the face of a man, a woman, a boy, a girl. I, I see the face that, that, that I know they're worth everything that has to take place. 
So God, we come just offering this portion of our earthly service as a reminder of the sacrifice you made. So God, I pray in advance right now for every preacher that will proclaim. I pray that even though they prepared, I pray that you give them your power. I've known them all long enough. I know that they've studied, but I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you grant them and give them your strength. Because as they stand today to proclaim on your behalf, God, I pray that something they say, even though it's a familiar story, that they make it come alive in a new way that it touches some heart, some mind, some spirit in a way that either provides comfort or provides reassurance. To let them know that you're still the same God. And God, we're kind of at a, an advantage because we know how the story ends. But those who were standing on that hill called Calvary on that Friday. I can only imagine the grief that they had. So God, it is also my prayer that we always ask for the power in which Jesus was raised to be our power, God. But on today, I pray that the grief that they felt resonates with us, that we dare not take this time for granted. Pray that somehow we don't get so excited about the, the pastel dresses and the, the Easter egg hunts and all of those things that we do to enjoy the Easter week in God. I pray that we never lose touch with the grief. I pray that we always remember. So God, I just pray that you have thine own way. Have thine own way. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen, 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 and amen. Right before we stand to sing our opening hymn 253, I was told that someone left their cell phone out on the table and Deacon Rick Spady has it. So if you're missing a cell phone, Deacon Rick Spady is out on the sanctuary level. Oh no, he's actually sitting right here. So Deacon Rick Spady has your phone if you're missing a phone, amen? And also, um, I would like to give Pastor Kwan uh, uh, his, 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 his hall pass, his hall pass, because you all know that it is the custom of Mount Carmel that preachers, when they come, they come. You know those the rules here. But, but, but Pastor Kwan uh, has to get back to his own church where they're having their seven last words. But you all know that Pastor Kwan was, was raised in ministry here at Mount Carmel. He's been with us every year, and, and he's had some, some health challenges. And when I called him and we spoke, I said, are you able to come? And he, he, he was resoundingly saying yes. So I just want you all to excuse him when you see him leave. Amen. Amen. So when you see him leave, don't think that he's just cutting out. The pastor and the pastor already had the conversation. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 253. The hymnals are found underneath the pews in front of you. Amen. Amen. And we will sing hymn number 253, Lead Me to Calvary, verses 1, 2, and 4, and we will follow the words as printed. Amen. Amen. amen.
is from the Gospel according to Luke chapter 23. And I'll be reading verses 32 to 34. And the Bible says, two others also who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And for just a few moments, we hear the heart of the crucifying one, Jesus from the cross, as he teaches us to keep first things first. Absolutely not. Not yet. I, I hear what you're saying, preacher. I understand, pastor, but no, not yet. I am not nearly ready for that. In, in what world, church, uh, who would do that? Not me. Would you? No, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine circumstances or time uh, in which you would ask anybody to do that. Uh, I don't think anybody would, nobody that I know. No, sir, no, ma'am, not today. First things first. No, 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 not until they. Uh, not until they say sorry and mean it. Uh, not until I feel like that sorry is real, and then maybe, I'm just telling the truth, then maybe I'll think about it. No, not, not yet. Not, not until they go back and they fix it. I know y'all are saved on today, but not until they tell the whole wide world what it is they did, how they did it, and then I'll think about it. Not until they, them, you know them, maybe it's you, but maybe it's me, maybe, maybe it's all of us. Not until they turn back the clock, not until they reverse time, not until they put the cat back in the bag, not until they unbreak the eggshell, not until they get every drip drop of milk that was spilled and put the tea back in the cup. And I know it sounds impossible, but then maybe after they do some of those things, then I'll think about it. But no, not, not yet. Uh, not until they snatch back those hurtful uh, words, that, those hate-filled words that they spoke and, and they erase the memory from my mind. Then I'll consider maybe doing first things first. Not until they, 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 they bring back to life all who were killed by their weapons and by their words. Not in this church, somewhere else. Not until, not until they, they are able to reach back through the corridors of time and undo all that they did. And then I want them to reach forward into the not yet and make it already all right. And once they stand firm in today and with a word they said it right, then I will release them from the ties that bind them to unforgiveness. But right now, I don't really care. Let them be like a weighted balloon that cannot fly. Let them be like an anchored ship that can't sail. That's not my problem. That's theirs. Let them be like a sinful soul that can't be saved, that can't be cleansed, that can't be reconciled, because I would never do anything like they did. That's just my testimony, Mount Carmel, on this morning, and maybe if you're honest, it's yours on today, but thanks be to God. Thanks be to the dying and then living again, God, that these are not the words of a dying Jesus of Nazareth. He did not die. No, he would not die, not until. 
Not until he prayed for you. He would not die, not until. Not until he carried the weight of your sin and of my sin. Not until. Not until he stirred, stood firm in the face of a fixed trial on behalf of our lives. Not until. Not until he took the punishment of the lashes on behalf of crimes against humanity that you committed. Not until. Not until he smelled of flesh because his skin was baking in the sun not until not until he allowed the thorns to be pressed into his head on behalf of minds created to think higher on these things who were now devising schemes and plans for evil not until he allowed the sharpened wrought iron to be driven into the spaces between his bones the flesh of the in flesh God not until his hands the ones that healed the chest and held you close the feet that did danced at their wedding all of it was broken sacrificially on this day this not so good day and before the world in the presence of everybody instead of coming down instead of saying a mumbling word he would not come down instead of recalling all of you and all of me who would be responsible for his suffering Jesus turned instead of remembering and recalling all who did it and he tapped into the thread that united self and self and self all three of them and to one who sent him he cried out to the one who went and before he died and lived again and before you can live again you must die and before you can live again you've got to do first things first before you can go forward and maybe that just begins with a word from eternity Telling us that before you sit down at the table on Sunday, you've got to forgive. First things first, you've got to forgive yourself. You've got to forgive them. You've got to forgive this and that. You've got to forgive God. First things first, because sometimes we forget that it was us. Thank you, Lord, that you kept First things first, and there may I, though blind as he, you washed all our sins away. And you kept first things first. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. First things first. Ooh. First things first. First things first. Let us stand and sing hymn number 252. Jesus, keep me near the cross.
Amen, amen. Now, uh, you know, sometimes it's, it's a blessing in disguise when you get what you ask for. I didn't want to be first. But now I had to wait till the pulpit cools, cools down a little bit. <laughs> Heavy word. Heavy word. Before I begin, I just want to give a shout out to a good friend and frat brother, the Reverend Milton Bradford, pastor of the Good Hope Baptist Church in Cleveland, Ohio area. He just, he's recovering from hip surgery. And so his good friend and frat brother, so Brother Bradford, Reverend Bradford, 06, good brother, 06. One of the things that's important for us as I begin today is to see the totality of the experiences that are before us. Not just the surface, but we want to always understand what the Lord has in this word for our well-being. Word two, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Word two. But I have titled this meditation, Good News on Good Friday. Good News on Good Friday. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this day, this time of remembrance. Bless each word that is uttered, that it may bless your people in a special way. Lord, bless your people. Lord, bless your people. Well, it's preaching time. It's preaching time. It's preaching time. Today is Good Friday, the day of suffering. Christians have set aside this day to retell the story of how the righteous Christ was crucified on Golgotha's hill for the sins of the unrighteous. It's a day filled with images and stories of torture, pain, and ultimately the death of God's only begotten son. What could possibly be good about Good Friday? Well, I'm here today to proclaim that there was, a good, there was good news on that good Friday, that first crucifixion Friday, there was some good news. In fact, if we focus too narrowly on the pain and the suffering inflicted on that day some 2,000 years ago, we will miss the blessings of the good news. Come on, go with me now. Jesus, the chosen one, God's only begotten son, his death and resurrection fulfilled scripture and brought salvation to the lost. Isaiah 53 says, he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I believe that to fully appreciate the good news of Good Friday, we must connect the dots of several significant events that point us to Good Friday, to the good news. Luke 22 describes how a Passover meal became the Last Supper. This is my body which is broken for you. This is my blood which is spilled for you, the new covenant in my blood, preparing a way for us in the future, a time to maintain communion with the Christ. The Passover lamb foreshadowed Jesus' own sacrificial death for the deliverance of the people of God. His time of prayer on the Mount of Olives, where he prayed that the bitter cup would be removed from him, but concluded that you will not your will but mine be done. In fact, he committed himself to doing what the Lord has sent him to do. That, in fact, he committed to take on all the evil that existed and all the sin that we had committed and will commit. During the trial before the Sanhedrin Council, he boldly proclaims his divinity, stating, hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. He wanted everyone to know in the place, in the temple, that I am he who said it would be coming. I am the Messiah. I am God. In the temple where they had rejected him. All of these events leads Jesus to the cross on Golgotha's hill. Whereas he's being crucified, he engages two criminals and teaches a master class on eternal salvation. The good news, the good news on Good Friday. Jesus hangs on to the cross, hangs on the cross with the assurance that God cannot be defeated and that his plan can only be postponed but not destroyed. A Roman crucifixion is a gruesome thing. It was designed to maximize pain, discomfort, and humiliation. So the scene was set 
Jesus had withstood the indignity of being flogged, spat upon, and ridiculed by the crowd. Now Jesus is hanging on the cross between two convicted felons. There is no doubt the felons or thieves have been justly tried and convicted of their crimes. These were not good people. They were some bad guys. They deserved where they were. They were being punished for the crimes they had committed. But not Jesus. After Jesus prays for his tormentors, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing. He turns his attention to the thieves. As they hang on the cross dying, the two thieves began to badger Jesus with repeated appeals for help. Thief one, or the mocking thief, the impenitent thief, the arrogant thief, spoke first. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. His interest was self-perseverance. He wanted to be saved. He wanted to be taken off that cross. He wanted his pain to stop. He wanted to be released from his sentence of death by crucifixion. Thief number two, the penitent thief, the remorseful thief, the insightful thief, chose a different tack. He began to have a dialogue with the Lord. Now, these were not calm conversations or a singular request for help, according to Russell Bradley Jones in his little book, Gold from Golgotha. The thieves kept loudly making their appeals over and over and over again. The impenitent thief kept begging him to save me, save me, save me. The impenitent thief kept begging for a place in God's kingdom. Help me, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, Lord. They just wanted the pain to stop. Both of them, however, recognized how important Jesus was. They knew he was an innocent man. They knew he was a special man. Not just how special. They had no idea they were dealing with the divinity. The one who had taken on the sins of the world. They believed Christ had power and influence. They believed he could get them off that cross. But the thieves were consumed with pain and just wanted it all to be over. In verse 40, the penitent thief rebuked the other thief for deriding Christ. You know, not only were they bombarding Christ with pleas and pleas of help, they also began to bicker up between themselves. He said, do you not fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? The thief then turns his attention to Jesus. Jesus, please remember me. Remember me, Lord, please remember me. Have you ever been in that kind of situation where you just continually, Lord, help? Lord, help? I can't handle this pain anymore. Just, Lord, help. Get me out of this situation. Lord, please help. I don't care if it was my fault. I did it. I know I did it. I'm wrong. I shouldn't have done it. But, Lord, just help. Just help. He expressed his guilt. He acknowledged Christ's divinity and requested Christ's assistance. Not in this world, but when Christ came into his kingdom, he was guilty and deserved to be put to death by crucifixion. Unlike his fellow thief, he was not attempting to avoid punishment for his sins, but forgiveness for that would allow him to spend eternity in the paradise with Jesus. So Jesus decided to respond not to the impenitent thief, not to the one who begged to be let off the cross now, but he responded to the confession of sin. He responded to the thief who said, thou art God. He responded to the thief who decided to surrender himself to God. It affirmed faith and faith alone in Christ as Savior is the key to salvation. I mean, these were bad guys. The key note here that it wasn't, there was nothing he had done to put himself on a cross that will keep him from salvation. All it took was faith. All it took was him saying, Lord, I've surrendered my life to you. All that I've done, all that I've not done, Lord, forgive me. Take me to paradise with you. Now, he probably didn't understand fully, completely, the theological significance of what he had just done. Wouldn't it be good if we all understood what we were about to do when we confess our sins and walk down the aisle and get the preacher our hand? That would be great, but not necessary. What was necessary is that he surrendered himself to the Lord. You know, individuals and families walk down these aisles every Sunday, not of this church, of churches throughout this country. And they come because they just want the pain to stop. They want the pain of loneliness, the pain of addiction, the pain of low economic situations. They just want the pain to stop. Our job is to embrace them when they come, 
to let them know that God loves them, to point them towards the cross, to help them meet the Lord Jesus Christ, their Savior, to help them to surrender their lives to Christ, to help them understand there's nothing that you had done from the front door to the time that you get here to the cross matters. As long as you're surrendering yourself to the Lord. That's what we need to do. So Jesus responded to the penitent thief. Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today. Not tomorrow. Not later on. Not after you've gotten things right. Not after you've gone to new members class. Not after you've completed the, the, the questionnaire. None of that matters. Today, based on your confession, based on your willingness to surrender yourselves, you will be with me in paradise. Oh, it's interesting how he did that. He did it in two parts. He started with a prefix. He said, assuredly, which means I will be there. I got your back. You can understand. You can bank on what I'm about to tell you. Assuredly, this is what's going to happen. You will be with me in paradise. Nothing else matters. No other debate. No other issues. You will be with me in paradise. The good news on Good Friday. Thou shalt will be with me in paradise. As long as I am, thou shalt be with me. Yeah. The penitent thief asked for a place in the kingdom of God. He received an immediate place in paradise and eternal home in heaven. Can we imagine that? Yeah. The good news on Good Friday? The good news on Good Friday was the assurance of salvation to everyone. Not just to the penitent thief, but also for me, for you, and everyone who calls on the Lord God as Savior throughout the existence of man. Good news on Good Friday. Amen, amen, and amen. Thank God for the good news on Good Friday. Let us stand and sing our hymn 240, He Will Remember Me, verses 1 and 2. Hymn number 240, He Will Remember Me.
In the gospel, according to St. John, the 19th chapter, the 26th and 27th verse, there you find the words of our text recorded. The New International Version reads in this manner, when Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The Spirit of the Lord has led me to this subject. Fire burning love from the cross. Will you say that with me? Fire, Fire. Burning, burning love from the cross. With the power and presence of the Holy Spirit, let us walk around the text. John, the gospel writer, records here the third word spoken by Jesus, our suffering Savior from the cross. It's a word to the caregivers. Dear woman, here is your son. And son, here is your mother. Jesus, the compassionate Savior, gave instructions from the cross to two whom he loved to be caretakers, one to another. He said it with burning love from the cross. For he was deeply concerned about his mother and his beloved disciple John. On the cross, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ was making the supreme sacrifice he was dying for sinners. You and I, you ought to get happy right there. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So none of us can boast that we don't have any sins past or present. Yet Jesus held death back to give it a divine assignment. He placed the well-being of others before himself. He was engaged in the magnificent work of salvation. Yet he does not overlook the responsibilities of family. He makes provisions for his mother and friend. Let me stop here a minute. Lord have mercy. For I would argue strongly that in far too many cases, we have lost our love and compassion for family and friends. Don't get quiet on me. Some of us not speaking to our family. Some of us are not speaking to our friends. We live in a society when it's all about us. We've lost love for one another. I always marvel at how people take selfies. How many do you need? Mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the fairest of them all? We take so many selfies of ourselves. When I was hungry, you gave me something to eat. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was in prison, you came to see about me. That's our responsibility. Family is a gift from God. The master's word for the cross is a word of a burning love. It's a word of affection. It's a word of compassion. It's a word of sacrifice. It's a work of the Lord. As believers, we're compelled to serve Jesus. Jesus said on one occasion to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. To be a servant of God is to live a life of sacrifice. All of us are servants. Whether you're a deacon, deaconess, pastor, preacher, choir member, you are still a servant. I don't want to hurt your feelings, but you are still a servant. Thanks be unto God. Jesus did not suffer and die on the cross without his ability to care for others. There were those present at Golgotha's Hill. 
who he cared about a great deal. The little group of followers and devoted men and women of God. His mother was among them. She had suffered a great deal as a result of her strange son. The gossip of his critics and enemies made his life unpleasant. Many times there were sarcastic remarks made about him. We have to watch what we say about people. Words hurt. I remember growing up and sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but words will never hurt me. Oh, that's far from the truth. <laughs> Somebody's here right now who's been hurt by some unkind words. Watch your words. Control your tongue. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. Help me paint the picture. In the midst of the crowd at the cross, Jesus, the beloved servant of God, saw his son, disciple. He was one of the inner circles. He was at the foot of the cross. He remained faithful to the end. Jesus, according to text, singles out two members of the group, his mother and his disciples. He gave them a divine assignment. He has a burning love for them. He spoke to his mother first. He said, dear woman, here was your son. He does not draw attention to himself, but deliberately diverts it to John, the disciple. Notice he does not say mother. He simply says woman. Then he tells John, here is your mother. It's your task to take care of her. Jesus was grateful for the sacrifice his mother had made for him. He was also thankful for his friend John. Lord have mercy. Don't forget the people who helped you get to where you are. I had a letter that I wanted to give Pastor Donald Moore, but I unfortunately left it in my office. And I wanted him to know that I'm grateful to God because after being a licentuant here, and Pastor Campbell now, and Pastor Emeritus, it was this pastor, the Reverend Dr. Donald Moore, who continues to allow me to stand behind this sacred pulpit. And I'm truly grateful. None of us get anywhere by ourselves. Talk about you pulled up yourself by your bootstraps. You don't even have a boot. <laughs> None of us can say we made it by ourselves. This burning love on the cross, as a result of that, I'm here this morning. I cannot tell you how grateful I am to be here. I was in the hospital. I was resuscitated 10 times. The doctor said he would never make it. But God. But God. But God. I was in a wheelchair. I couldn't walk, couldn't even take a shower by myself couldn't feed myself. My family was at my bedside and they were praying for me in that pain on their face. But I made a decision, Pastor Donald Moore, that for the rest of my life, I'm going to be on fire for the Lord. Now somebody might say, don't take all that, but you don't know what I've been through. I don't look like I've been through anything, but God, I'm on fire. I want my life to have passion, zeal, yeah. enthusiasm. Yeah. I'm not going to wait until the party's over. I'm going to praise God every day. I'm going to give him thanks. I can walk. I can talk. I can raise my hand. I can lift my feet. I can run. I can shout. I'm on fire. Say fire. Say fire. Say fire. Fire, fire, fire. Fire, fire, fire. Fire! Too much is given, much is required. He's been good to me. Has he been good to you? Has he healed you? 
Has he saved you? Has he delivered you? They say I'm on fire. I can't hear you. Fire! Fire! I told our church I want to be a Pentecostal church. What does that mean? I'm still Baptist, but I want the Holy Ghost to move. I don't want to be around anybody who don't have any fire. Amen. Amen and amen. amen. On fire. And, and y'all can y'all can see the shoes. The shoes say fire. <laughs> amen. Let us continue in the spirit of worship as we stand and sing hymn 387. I am thine, O Lord. Hymn 387.
Mark 15, 33 through 34, in the English Standard Version reads, and when the sixth hour had come, it was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I want to preach for just a few moments from an interrogative. How can you sing at a time like this? When I pastored in Morristown, New Jersey, one of my members, who's now gone on to be with the Lord, was convalescing at a local nursing home. I didn't have the pleasure of knowing her in her early years, and by the time I got to meet her, her mind was not what it was as a younger person. Every time I engaged with her, even her family who would come to see her, she could not utter much that was cognitive and could not have great conversation. She would do things that were strange and she would sit there sometimes seemingly in a space that we could not understand. Yep. Yep. And yet, before I left every first Sunday when we would serve her communion, she would grab my hand and would not let me leave until we sang some hymns. Though her mind was not cognitive to have a conversation, she knew every verse and every stanza. I can still hear Sister Ruth Terry holding my hand, saying, blessed assurance, yeah. Jesus is mine. Yeah. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. I'm an heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song praising my Savior all the day long. She would say, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul. I, I raise Sister Terry's name in introduction today because I'm reminded of her every time I come to this text. It emphasizes the truth that I want to say to you today that our human inclination is to allow the issues that we face to infiltrate and to control our spirit. Much of the time it causes us to react negatively when things affect us from the outside in. It's hard to express joy in the midst of sorrow. It's hard not to complain when you're in the midst of pain. It's hard not to lament in the midst of distress. And we are prone not to sing songs when we don't feel any joy. Yeah. And yet the scriptures encourage us just the opposite when it comes to dealing with the hardships we face in life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear James saying, count it all joy yeah, yeah. when you fall into divers temptations knowing that the trial of your faith worketh patience. Yes. Paul told Timothy to endure hardship like a good soldier. Yes. Well, what I want to say to you today is that despite our inability to control what life brings us, we can manage our responses to it. Yes. I don't have to allow the vicissitudes of life to supervise my success. Yes. I, I can handle the hell that I'm dealt with somehow by the power and grace of God. Ah. Unless your perspective and my focus somehow is centered on the unchanging character of God the Father, then we may unnecessarily allow our circumstances to dictate our responses and risk not understanding real joy. Free. So knee deep now in the crucifixion, we wade into this story with Jesus seeking meaning in the suffering and humiliation and torture, seeking assurance in the pain and grief, showing a reflection of our own experiences to guide us in finding the holy in what haunts us. And he does so with the opening words of a song. 
Psalm 22 is recorded as a plea for deliverance amongst suffering and hostility. And this was a song written for the leader to sing it in tune to another familiar hymn that the Jewish people were used to singing when trouble arose. Uh, it offers somehow a priestly oracle in the healing that is offered that reverses a person's condition and the prayer that starts off ends in a praise. The scriptures teach us that it was a psalm of David. So long before our Savior died, God prepared for his consolation in this, in this psalm. Jesus came to fulfill the sickness and the agony and the abandonment felt by its author, but he also came to experience the triumph that comes on the other side. Yeah. And in the midst of pain, dying in the midst of this suffering, in the midst of things happening that cannot even be fathomed by our minds today, Jesus does not complain, but he sings. For psalms were made to be sung. I know it's weird that we see it in, as he is quoting the words, but I am somehow fool enough to believe that he's not just quoting the songs. That just like you and I, when a song comes to mind, a tune comes along with it. That's right, that's right. And while he's on the cross in the midst of suffocation, he presses up on that spike in his feet and utters this song in his pain. As he begins to quote this song all around, people could hear the melody ringing in their head. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, Pastor, it, it may have been more encouraging if he had quoted the 23rd song. Yeah. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil, for thou art with me. Maybe it would have made better sense if he quoted Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? Maybe if he quoted Psalm 91, we'd have better connection with it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. But instead, he quotes a hymn knitted to the harp strings of his heart to communicate the chords of the melody of his soul. My God, my God, why? Has thou forsaken me? Why does Jesus sing this song on the cross? I want to submit to you today that the text is tailored to teach us that he sings this song, number one, because of what it translates. It's a song of identification that translates the pain of human suffering. My God, my God, why? Have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? My God, I cry all day, but you do not answer. And by night and do not find rest. You are wholly enthroned on the praises of Israel. In our ancestors, they trusted you. They trusted you and you delivered them to them. To you, they cried and they were saved. In, they, in you, they trusted and they were not put to shame. He's saying, listen, I'm a worm, I'm a human, I'm scorned by others and despite others and somehow they're seeking to mock me and to scorn me. He's saying that somehow there's something going on that I don't know what's happening and this song is sung as an identification to the pain and the suffering that humans go through and Jesus sings this song to translate our pain. You can be in a rough spot and don't know what to say sometimes. You, 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 you and I sometimes don't know the words that come out of our mouth, but it's good to know that the word has already said it for us. That God somehow knows what it's like to be in our struggles. Jesus knows all about our struggle. And he will guide until the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. This passage is labeled the death of Jesus. As if we can tell where death really starts. We know where life starts at the first breath. But we don't know where life ends at the last breath. Does it end at the last? 
last breath or does it end somewhere along the way where we've given up hope and we don't know what's going to happen down the road when we don't know and cannot be assured but I can tell you that in every little experience when death is walking us down we feel isolated and by ourselves whether we are in the throes of death or despair or alienation or or loneliness or addiction or suffering or grief whatever it takes of us the deepest and darkest places of our soul are exposed and we may never be possible for us to feel something other than being abandoned feeling forsaken by God feeling forsaken by others feeling lonely down on the inside is the darkest of human experiences and yet it's integrated into our humanity is part of the cycles of life that somehow before we grow before we live and before we die we got to experience what it's like to walk by ourselves and even in this happening we see that Jesus is somehow communicating an integral part of how we go through our situations because even though we may feel like God's presence is not there if we could not feel his presence not there how could we feel it when his presence arrives if we could not feel it in our relationships that when love disappears then how could we know when love shows up again you understand feeling abandoned by God and actually being abandoned by God are two different things and it's okay to feel a way when you understand in your mind that God is still on the throne this song helps us identify because it translates a very real human emotion that all of us have and I'm glad that somehow the word knows how to translate our emotions it witnesses the war that we have with worry and the posture that we have with pain it speaks to our dilemma that causes doubt when feelings are overwhelmed and somehow our outcomes are outnumbered and you just don't get what you feel sometimes but don't get don't forget that sometimes what you feel is not real it's just a feeling that you're going through and you got to let feelings do what they need to do you got to feel it embrace it hold it and let it go but don't live in it longer than the moment because God is still on the throne it translates something but he sings this song because of what it triggers it's a song of progression it starts in one place but it progresses forward my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? And then in verse 3, yet you are holy. Enthroned on the praises of Israel. Verse 9, yet it was you who took me from the womb and kept me safe on my mother's breast. It's a word of transition. It triggers, listen, it triggers hope. The singer of this song ought to be encouraged knowing that their present troubles would not be permanent troubles. Free. What it says is this, you may start off in a dark place, but you're going to end up in a brighter place. And why Jesus is singing this song is because it triggered hope in the midst of his suffering. He knew that it was Friday, but it wasn't always going to be Friday. The songs of our faith and the songs of our people have always made a progression toward hope. That's what separates the gospel from the blues. It's good news. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master, there's a transition of the sea heard my despairing cry and from the waters he lifted me now safe and my love lifted me love li when nothing else could help love lifted me in contemporary songs we say it won't last like this always sooner or later it's going to turn in your favor because it's turning around for me he's trying to let us know that somehow in the meditations of our heart it reveals 
that even in the midst of the crucifixion while he was bleeding while he was being scourged in the midst of this painful situation hope was still somewhere to be found and somebody needs to be able to sing along along with our ancestors when trouble comes in your life that there's a bright side somewhere there's a bright side somewhere don't you stop until you find that there's a bright side somewhere Jesus sings this song because of what it translates. Jesus sings this song because of what it triggers, but he sings it in the last instance because of what it transposes. The word transpose means to change the position or sequence. It's when an adjustment is made to the outcome while the same thing is being done. Uh, the song, this song put Jesus in a different position with his situation and the enemy. Where the outcome would not be that the adversity or rather what the adversary had considered. But somehow the situation was now not in control of the adversary when Jesus began to sing this song. Now Jesus is controlling the situation. As the song is continued, it crescendo into a declaration of praise for all those who dare to sing it as you get down to the end of the chapter of the of the, of the sermon or rather the end of of the of the of the quote you you find that at the end of the song it says i will tell of your name to my brothers and my sisters in the midst of the congregation i will praise you died up there and just left us with a question why have you forsaken me why have you left me like this it's one thing when you wonder about people but it's another thing when you wonder about god it becomes the magna carta of all counseling why why if i could just understand why maybe i could get through this if i could just understand why they left me high and dry maybe i could make it by myself if i understand why they fired me from that job if i could understand why i'm having to make it on meager fare why is the question that we raise but jesus starts off with why but he ends up ending with somehow an acclamation. He's not an, in a note of despair, but rather in a key of certainty. Because he's not asking his mother. He's not asking his brothers. He's not asking his disciples. But he's talking to God. And as he does this, he transposes the control of his suffering from the adversary into his own hands. He's saying, listen, I'm not going to let this feeling interfere with God's ability to somehow get the glory out of this I still know that God is in control and even though he's silent it doesn't mean that he's not present in the situation ultimately what this makes this is a song of worship because if I can worship God when I don't feel God if I can find somehow to give him glory when things aren't going my way that's when real power is found in my circumstances I don't feel him but I'm still talking to him I can't discern him, but I'm still giving him glory. Things ain't working out, but I'm still coming to church. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I'm still going to find my way to service. Because that's where real worship begins. It doesn't make sense, but I'm going to keep on singing. And if you and I can sing and worship when you cannot feel God, then what else can the devil do to you? You can have my body, but you can't have my joy. I'm I might be hurting, but I still have hope. I might be in pain, but I still got peace. I might be suffering, but I still got my song. Why should I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, a constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and I know I know he watches over me this is my story this is my song praising 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 How 
how can you sing at a time like this? How can you sing at a time like this? And I have a funny feeling, a sneaky suspicion that many of us can sing when we don't feel like it because of the next song we're about to sing. Hymn number 244, the old rugged cross. Let us stand and sing.
The scripture reads, later, knowing that everything had now been finished, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of vinegar wine was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending your son to pay the ultimate price for our sins. Now, Lord, empty out of me all that should not be. Take out everything that's not like you. Do that, Lord, so that there might be plenty of room for your love in your way. And then, Lord, make me just the way you want me to be, so that I might be an effective conduit for your word to your people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We have come together on this day to take a close look at the culmination of a mission of love, to bear witness to the fulfillment of prophecy to seek to find meaning and hope in the predetermined pain and suffering of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our focus on the last words of Christ as he hung on the cross is born out of our desire to continually glean some form of meaning, explanation, or affirmation from them with respect to our relationship with God. After all, it is in this moment, this sacrifice, that is the linchpin of our salvation. Jesus' last word from the cross serve as a summary of his ministry and message. Dictionary.com defines a summary as a comprehensive and usually brief abstract recapitulation or compendium of previously stated facts or statements. In other words, it gives the main ideas of a text or discussion, but not the details. For the next few moments that I will be before you, I want us to focus on the portion of Jesus' message this moment helps us summarize, which is make your needs known. There's a story of a farmer who owned an old mule that fell into a deep, dry well. The farmer, hearing the mule's cries for help, decided it was too old and not worth saving. He called his neighbors to help him fill in the well. As they shoveled the dirt into the well, the mule realized what was happening and began to shake off each shovelful stepping up on the growing mound of dirt. Eventually, the mule was able to step out of the well, safe and alive, because it had made its need to live clear. Yes, sir. When you take the time to examine this story in the moment in time depicted in the text, it's easy to allow your focus to fall on the immediate results of the request. Yes, dirt in one case, and sour wine in the other. Mm. Now, mm. while there is a message in the result, we need to focus on what can sometimes be overlooked, and that is the power in the pronouncement. Yes, sir. Which brings us to our first and presumably most obvious revelation in the text. Yeah. An unspoken need can't be met. Yes, Come on, now. One could argue that had the mule not made a sound, someone would have come along, discovered it was in the well, and the story would have gone on the same. The Bible tells us that Jesus hangs his head and dies not too long after this moment. So one could also argue that he would have done so whether he expressed his need or not. But a more intentional look at the text shows why making our needs known is necessary. Verse 28 reads in part, and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. Matthew 5, 17 states, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Yes, Jesus could not totally fulfill his purpose of fulfilling Psalms 22:15. My mouth is dried up like a postard, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust and death. In 69:21, they put gall in my food and gave me vinegar for my thirst, without saying, yeah. I'm thirsty. Yeah. Jesus didn't decide to suffer in silence thinking, they know I've been hanging on this cross all day. <laughs> Surely they know I'm thirsty. The mule didn't sit in silence thinking, surely the, fa the farmer knows I'm missing and will naturally come look for me in this well. No. It made it, it, made it known exactly what it needed. Whatever the mule went on to do once it got out of that well could not have been accomplished without at first crying out for help. Too often we do ourselves the disservice of convincing ourselves we don't need help that we can get the job done without help. Worse yet, we recognize that we need help, 
but would much rather continue to suffer than ask for help. How many dreams have you let die because you refuse to cry out for help? How many problems are you still trying to solve because you refuse to make your needs known? How many expectations do you have unfulfilled because you refuse to make your needs known? Don't allow yourself to stay trapped in that hole. Don't continue to live a parched life. Tell someone what you need. Now, let me stop some of you before you go there by relating the second revelation in the text. Not only do you need to speak your need in order for it to get met, you need to speak it even if you don't think you're going to get the response you need or the response you think you need. A jar of wine and vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. The farmer... Hearing the mule's cries for help, decided it was too old and not worth saving. He called his neighbors to help him fill in the well, and they started shoveling dirt into the well. When Jesus states his need, he had no reason to believe that it would be met at all, let alone favorably. The soldiers had already used that same wine to mock him as he suffered. When they did offer it to him, it's definitely not what Jesus would have preferred, but it was a solution nonetheless. As the dirt descended on it, I'm sure it was not what the mule had in mind when it envisioned what help was going to look like. While we're examining this moment, allow me to caution you about judging the manner in which people seek to meet your needs. Yes, the soldiers did use the wine to mock Jesus at one point, and yes, the wine was sour, but someone amongst those soldiers felt compelled to actually give Jesus something to drink. More importantly, that wine was the same wine that the soldiers were drinking. They gave what they had to give. Yes, the neighbors started throwing dirt in to bury the mule, but they never stopped shoveling. I'm sure at least one of them realized what was happening and made sure the process continued. Before you turn your nose up to criticize the form your help takes, take a moment to see if it's working. My time is short, so as I draw to a close, allow me to share one more thought. Regardless of how the help was intended or the form that it took, it was vitally important that the need for it be spoken for one very important reason. The mule needed that dirt to get out of the well. It served the purpose of helping it overcome its situation and declare victory. The same can be said for Jesus. Jesus needed that bitter wine for one very specific reason. Jesus had been hanging on that cross in the hot sun for hours. His lips and throat were surely sandpaper dry. He needed to make the need for that wine known for the same reason you need to make your needs known. The next time you're in that state of need, I need you to make that need known so that once it's met, you can share in this moment with me. In that moment, I want you to do like I imagine Jesus did. I don't have the technical expertise that Pastor has for how this works, but I've been parched before. I want you to stop and draw as much liquid from that hyssop as you can. Do like I imagine Jesus did. Feel it moisten your vocal cords as you swallow it. Lick your lips. Take a deep breath and do exactly what Jesus did next. Use it to declare your victory. Make your knees known. You can't declare victory without it. Make your needs known. As we continue in the spirit of worship, I ask that you stand as we sing hymn number 554, Must Jesus Bear the Cross Alone? Hymn number 554.
Good afternoon. afternoon. A blessing to be here with you and to share the sixth word from the cross, which comes from John chapter 19, verses 30. In the New Living Translation, it reads like this. When Jesus had tasted the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. Jesus, all for you, always and only ever for you. Amen. It is finished. He is dead. Hold a mirror to his mouth. Put your finger on that big vein in his neck. Stick a spear in his side. It won't matter. Jesus is dead and it is finished. The disappointment and betrayal, the heartbreak and suffering, the piercing of his hands and feet, the hours of public humiliation and pain, it is finished. Bearing the weight of the world, charting the pathway for peace and forgiveness and new life. Casting our sin and failure into the sea of forgetfulness. Putting an end to the practice of sacrifice. It is finished. Overcoming every evil that came against him in every form and in every way. Defeating the power and sting of death. Flipping off the grave. It is finished. Jesus' time here on earth in this embodied form where he laid aside his rights and privileges, where he took on brown skin and bones and manifested humility in the most beautiful way. It is finished. His years of healing, get up and walk. The years of teaching, blessed are the poor and the merciful and the peacemakers. The years of challenging religious leaders like me and the systems they perpetuated. You hypocrites with your long prayers and your judgy attitudes, following all the rules and forgetting their points. It is finished. The times he went out of his way, completely off script and off course, to Samaria and to the Gerasenes and to Philadelphia to free the captives. And when he restored the sight of the blind and the spiritually blind, and when he threw over tables as an act of defiance against the exploitation and oppression of the poor, it is finished. The way he characterized God as a father who would hike up his robe and run toward the lost and the broken. In the way that he forgave people even before they asked and even when they never asked. The way he showcased the depth of God's grace and love and how it pushes the boundaries of what is reasonable and justified and makes so many of us uncomfortable. Free, it free. is finished. Jesus' time here on earth in this embodied form, it is finished. And with his last breath, he proclaims it and the sound of it. Man, it is better than that moment when the choir hits the high note. It's giving absolute victory. And we know that Jesus' victory is our victory. Do you know that? That his victory is our victory because he makes it so. And so we praise him for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is finished. Jesus' time here on earth, his ministry is finished. But you are not finished. I am not finished. We are not 
finished, Dr. Moore. You see, on that day at Golgotha, Jesus breathed his last breath and he gave up the ghost. But on the day of resurrection, his lungs filled again with that same holy breath. And when he met his disciples in that upper room, he breathed that breath on them, saying basically, you are not finished. I am not finished. We are not finished. We are not finished wrapping God's people in a story of love rather than a story of fear and violence. We're telling young college men at Eastern University, men like Stefan, that he's not going to hell just because he has a few questions about faith. Yeah. We're making sure that neurodivergent kids like Ariel and Isaac know that they too are fearfully and wonderfully made. We are not finished demanding an end to gun violence or feeding the hungry or providing shelter to the homeless. We are not finished making street corners into altars and correcting bad and harmful theology around mental illness and purity culture. We are not finished practicing humility or boldly stepping outside of our comfort zones. We are not finished watching God make highways in the desert or believing that God can and does do a new thing, a new thing, and often we are not finished acknowledging our history as a country or combating the sin of racism in our communities and, my God, in our churches or repairing the harm done to indigenous people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are not finished, Dr. Moore. We are not finished narrowing the gap in incarceration rates and addressing the fact that black people are sent to jail at more than four times the rate of white people. We are not finished challenging the church to think about faith as more than simply what we believe, but also, and more importantly, as how we live and move and what we stand for. We are not finished securing basic human rights for children and immigrants and the queer community and equal rights and equal pay for women. We are not finished addressing the opioid epidemic and freeing the captives whose bodies are literally frozen at Kensington and Somerset. And we are not finished inviting them to new life and freedom. We are not finished, church. We are not finished challenging corrupt leaders in the world and in the church. People who care more about their own self-interest than the people they are meant and elected to serve. People who make money off of the misfortune and fear of others. We are not finished washing the dirty cracked feet of sinners and saints who have walked roads tougher than you and I can imagine. We are not finished baptizing them with water and grace and affirmation. We are not finished, y'all. We are not finished seeing God's kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, or loving our neighbors and our enemies, or allowing grace and forgiveness to stretch their arms as wide as Jesus did. And so, Jesus, keep breathing your holy resurrection breath on us. Breathe on us today and remind us and convict us that even though it is finished, even though your earthly life and ministry is finished, ours is not. Bike up, bike up, bike up. We are not finished. As we head into Resurrection Sunday, we enter that Sunday knowing that we are not finished and we have work to do. And it's only because of the blood of Jesus that any of us can stand and proclaim, but more importantly, finish the work that God has tasked us to do. Amen? Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number 262, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus.
I said, thank God that Dr. Moore put space in between me and Reverend Banks. <laughs> but then he had the nerve to put me after Dr. Banker. <laughs> Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Strangely, these are these last words from Jesus are some strange words. But these words are strange because they demonstrate a person who is at the point of death, who is speaking with inten intention intentionally, with self-assurance, who is in control, but who is also at spiritual peace. While suffering emotionally and mentally and physically with the sinful weight of the world on his back and shoulders, Jesus proclaims a one-sentence prayer that contradicts how one would behave under the normal pressure of brokenness, betrayal, dysfunction, injustice, oppression, and demonic evil. Well, you will agree with me this afternoon that what happens to Jesus on Friday is not just an occurrence of government oppression, religious trauma, or a cancel culture. But rather, this is an orchestrated evil by Satan because Paul puts it like this, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Yeah but against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in this air, in the atmosphere. Now, whether you want to believe it or not, this is a diabolical force like fear that Howard Thurman suggests that dogs the footsteps of the poor and the dispossessed and the disinherited. Oh, and while all of these incidences are taking place, Jesus still has enough strength and breath to utter more words from a place of power yeah. when he says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Yeah, yeah. Now, Jesus is saying these words. Why? Because Jesus has been put into a situation where his enemies have thought that they have done something, but Jesus is getting ready to teach them, you ain't really done anything. Yeah. Jesus says, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Why in the world does Jesus feel the need to utter more words from the cross? Well, one would think that this sixth word would be sufficient to declare, then give up the ghost or breathe his last breath. But this is the danger when looking at the text with 21st century post-resurrection exegetical eyes. For if you are looking at it with a first century lens, it is finished, leaves too much speculation, inter interpretive speculation. For if I am a Roman or a Pharisee who was standing at the cross, when I hear these words of the sixth word of Jesus, one could conclude that they have Jesus back up against the wall. That Jesus is now finished and that he is now over. But if the last words it is finished, then the enemy could walk away way satisfied knowing that they have accomplished what they have set out to do and so before Jesus um, before they could get happy and go off on their misinterpretation of what has transpired Jesus opens up his mouth and in pastors he remix he says wait I got one more. In other words, uh, you're feeling me this afternoon because you know what it's like to be caught up in the sixth word condition where your enemies are just standing around, logging onto social media, waiting to see the results of their evil systematic actions and intentions on your life. But how many of y'all know that God has a way of allowing the enemy to commit the action but miss the accomplishment of what he's trying to do? That God has a way of not allowing your enemies not to get the results 
result of what they are seeking for. For God will leave them confused about their conclusion. And so Jesus here says something else so that they don't think that they can walk away feeling accomplished about what they did to Jesus. Now, you're sitting there, Mount Carmel, and you're saying, Pastor Heath, but you don't see the text. The text says that Jesus died. Well, I come by to suggest that even though Jesus died, what was more important was what Jesus said at this time. Because even with committing murder, they made a mistake of letting Jesus have one more word. And if they would have found a way to shut his mouth maybe just maybe church they would have won the battle but because they gave Jesus one more Jesus flips the script on their evil intentions now after hearing these seven last words of Jesus you and I should leave the sanctuary church encouraged knowing that though Jesus died God still has the last word that though your enemies may trip on you God is capable and able to overcome your enemy's evil intention in other words I got one more I got one more I got one more I know you sitting there you're asking yourself where in the world did you get a phrase like I got one more from well in 2019 before walking away from the NBA Vince Carter told Rachel Nichols and Stephen A. Jackson about his plan to leave professional basketball but Vince Carter told them listen though I'm getting ready to leave basketball I got one more inside of me in other words before I'm done I'm really not done because I got something with inside of me that is pushing me to let me know that this thing ain't over and so before you quit on yourself before you give up and say you can't do it before you listen to your critics and come to the surmise that you'll never make it never give your enemies the satisfaction to walk away with their selfish misguided interpretation no look up to your heavenly father look within yourself and shout out with a loud cry and declare that greater is he that's within me than he that's within this world in other words look within yourself and say self I got one more now when you recognize you got one more you will pray to the father and the father will move you from being in the wrong hands to being placed in the right hands Pain is a real thing, y'all, especially when people and created systems are strategically setting out to crucify you. And Jesus quotes Psalms 31, verse 5, a prayer of lament because Jesus is in deep anguish over the recent events that has led him to be suspended in the air, nailed to a wooden cross. While he's in pain, Jesus shows he's in control. Uh, as a child of God, you can be simultaneously put into these two to, to these two tensions because it's all about what state you choose to lean into more in other words you can lean into being in pain or you can lean more into knowing God's in control in other words as a believer we live in the two tensions of going through but coming through we live in the tension of knowing trouble is on on every side but God is able in it to do exceedingly and abundantly in other words Jesus shows his enemies that you may have hurt me but I'm still in control Jesus is leaning into his fellowship with the father rather than reducing himself to the plan of his enemies yeah. and you need to stop giving people more power and more influence over your life who mean you no good and who don't add value to your situation in other words uh, when trouble is on every side learn how to lean into the fellowship of almighty God yeah. when you can't make it learn how to lean into the 
person who's able to make you make sure you make it through your situation learn that with life you come into life with these two tensions but you got a God who's already overcome the world so that you can make it through your situations Jesus passed the hands, y'all, of too many people over these last 24 hours. For look at it, Judas, Judas handed him over to the chief priests and elders. The chief priests and elders handed him over to Pilate. Pilate washed his hands before sending him to the guards to be manhandled and beaten and bruised. Others used their hammer and their nails to nail him to the cross. Then they used their hands to, lure, to hoist him up on the cross in the air they use their hands to throw dice for his clothes Jesus said in garden of Gethsemane the son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners they whipped him and stripped him with their hands but after all that was done Jesus says I'm still in control father into thy hands I command my spirit Jesus is it has uh, Dr. Moore, what psychologists and spiritual directors call the or a non-anxious presence. In other words, it's the ability to be fully present in troubled situation without having your troubled situation control you emotionally. And while everyone around is in panic, you're operating in the spirit of non-anxious presence. All because you shout it out father forgive them I'm father into thy hands I commend my spirit in other words uh, when you're hooked up with the Lord God knows how to give you peace uh, to be able to still focus on what's ahead of you even though your situations are totally out of control uh, and I found that out in myself this year that when God stripped me naked I still was able to have a undistracted focus that showed me that God God ain't through with what God is trying to do in my life and that if God strips you naked then God must be the only one who can clothe you back together again to get through your situation I was in nine anxious presence look at Jesus y'all as I hasten he's not wavering or rambling He's not uncertain or indecisive. He's not distracted by his pain or emotional trauma. But rather, Jesus is in a non-anxious presence. How do I know that, Pastor Banks? Because look at what Jesus does. Jesus is confident and fully aware of what he's doing and what he is saying. I know who I'm talking to. Father, I know what I need to give up, my spirit. I know where I needs to be into thy hands. In other words, despite my situation, I'm in control because I'm in the right hands. Jesus, last word in prayer from the cross, not only contradicts our enemy's misguided interpretation of how we should respond when we are being crucified. But God knows how to move us also from being in the wrong hands and placing us in the right hands. But Jesus, last words in prayer, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit, is the expression for the household of faith who possess deep trust and security in God. In other words, this prayer isn't simply for the dying, but it's a prayer of power for the living. Y'all yeah. miss that. Uh, he's not just saying it because he's dying, but he's letting us know that even before death, you can pray this prayer because it gives you power for the living. For in the Church of England, Deandra, Pat preach of did the Church of England practices the ancient office of comply because comply comes from the Latin word completorium, which means completion. Members of monastic communities pray every night before the end of the end of the day 
and they would pray this prayer of Psalms 31 verse 5 into your hands I commend my spirit you will redeem me O Lord God of truth after pronouncing this prayer the people will go into quietness and start to reflect on the goodness of the Lord there would be no conversation there would be no noise this prayer completes the day and services. It indicates that the ending is indeed an ending without any additions. Jesus couldn't leave with what happened on the cross with it is finished because God wasn't done yet. And so Jesus had to give them one more that was inside of him. When Jesus said, Father, into thy hands, this prayer is indeed the end without any additions. For we leave the sanctuary silent in worship and reflective knowing that our sins have been washed away and that the penalty of our sins no longer have dominion over us. But I stop by to let us know that this prayer isn't just for somebody dying, but this prayer is for you and I that are still living. Because it's not just for the sleeping, but it's for the waking. To live for the Lord is a distinctly counterculture way of behaving. It tells the world that we not only trust in the Lord, that trust in the Lord life after death, but we trust in the Lord life before death. Yeah. And when you go home in silent church, when you go home in silent after reflective worship, let God flame the spirit of your flame the fire of your spirit to tell your accusers to tell your enemies and to tell the systematic structures that create evil to be accomplished in your life that you no longer that you may give up let them know i got one more inside of me tell your detractors i got one more inside of me let them know that god has given me something that keeps me moving on when i don't want to that keeps me smiling when there's nothing to laugh about that keeps me shouting when everything is mute i got one more inside of me and so as i leave you and bid you farewell look at what's broken in your life and tell that thing i got one more inside of me when you tell the, when, when, when they tell you you can't make it tell yourself self I got one more inside of me when your sickness discourages you and tells you all hope is gone tell that sickness I got one more inside of me when the news of the world shakes your foundation tell the foundations I got one more inside of me and when they ask you why are you so certain tell them my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but only lean on Jesus' name. For it's on Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground are sinking sand. In other words, tell your situation, I got one more because Christ is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. And what Christ things will always be all right because Christ is here today he's there today he'll always be there there's nothing that can overcome you because Jesus walks with you and he talks to you and he tells you that he is your own you can overcome why because there's one more prayer inside of you you can make it because you got one more inside. We've been to the foot of the cross. We've heard the seven last words preached. And we're able to leave with reflecting on no matter how bad things get. You still have one more. When I opened up in prayer, I said, I pray that we don't get so caught up with the pastel colors and the Easter eggs. And I pray that we never get caught up because we live on the other side of the story and we know how the story ended. And I said that I pray that we still 
try to connect and feel the grief of the people back at Calvary. So as we prepare to close out in the spirit of worship, and as we sing, Were You There? I want you to listen to the words. I want you to feel the words. Were you there when they crucified him? Were you there? Let us stand and sing hymn 254, Were You There?
Amen. 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 Let's please give all of our preachers another hand. It is my prayer that as we dismiss from this place, but never from thy presence, that you reflect over the words that were shared to inspire, encourage, and cause you to reflect as we enter this resurrection weekend. Remind you as you depart, the ushers and trustees will be at the door to collect any tokens of love that you may have for the service. And then may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's children said, Amen. Amen. Now go in peace. <laughs>